viewers, they won't go boldly where no Indian has gone before. That first belongs to Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma. But India's four space astronauts will certainly go the furthest any Indian has gone in a ma made in India, made in Bharat spacecraft. In Kerala, Prime Minister Modi earlier this week pinned astronaut wings on the sculpted chests of a quartet of Air Force pilots, Prashant Balakrishnan Nair, Angad Pratap, Ajit Krishnan and Shubhanshu Shukla, who will rocket into space late this year as part of the Gaganyaan mission. After the ceremony, Modi turned his attention to the audience in the cavernous auditorium of the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center and intoned that the astronauts are, and I quote him, are not just four names of human beings, they are the four powers that are going to take the aspirations of 140 crore Indians to space and Indian is going to space after 40 years, unquote. When the tryst with low Earth orbit happens, India's space agency will be inevitably hailed for its enviable ability to take a great leap for mankind on a shoestring budget. Just a few months ago, when India became the first ever nation in history to land on the moon's south face, almost all commentators fixated on India's frugal $2 billion space budget, a fraction of the four other countries that have landed on the moon. The United States and China have exponentially bigger space spends at about $62 billion and $12 billion respectively. There was also, of course, the obligatory reference to ISRO's early days when its scientists clearly fired up by nothing more than a Promethean instinct. It certainly wasn't the piffling salary, I can tell you that, would transport rocket parts on their bicycles. But if India's space program must complement Bharat's great power aspirations, as Modi hopes, he will need to provide it generous outlays to wean it off the endearing, jugarified, as they call it, viewers, ingenuity that has brought it this far. Now, there are some reasons that this investment is needed. And let's open this conversation up and bring in the experts to talk about why we actually need to spend more, not less. Why we need to set aside all those naysayers who say, oh, we are a poor country. We should be spending on this and that priority not space exploration. So uh, let me first bring in uh, Amitabha Ghosh. Needs no introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We all know him as a leading space scientist. He worked on the Mars mission, NASA's Mars mission. So he's not somebody who has also been uh, completely uh, ignorant of big spends. He knows what it takes. Space is hard. Uh, so Amitabha Ghosh, let me just ask you this. Should we now really, in some ways, unleash the animal spirits and let ISRO become the cage, well, become the tiger that it isn't right now? It's a caged tiger. Right. So I'm not going to go into the politics. I'll just yeah. dwell on the engineering. Of course. So, you know, we have been in this robotic space flight. And NASA does robotic space flight. I have done robotic space flight. See, robotic space flight and human space flight are completely different. You know, you might go to the moon, but if you're going to the moon with astronauts, you have to make sure that the astronauts' uh, health and well-being are there. You, this is one thing you're going to increasingly hear, redundancy. You need redundancy. If you're, if you're staying in your house and your power fails, what are you going to do? Here, say, spacecraft, you're going to the moon. What are you going to do if, you're, if the power fails? What will, if the navigational sensors fail? So there has to be a lot of built-in redundancy, and this will bring in cost. You know, you have to think of many, many ways things can go wrong and how are you going to troubleshoot them? What will you do if the astronauts develop fever? What if there's an irregular heart rhythm? The temperature of the cabin has to be maintained. So all these, see, for a robotic mission, it is very easy. The robot, the rover does not need any temperature constraints, doesn't need water, food. So the... the uh, the cost probably is going to be five times or, or ten times. Even if you do it very frugally, whatever your baseline cost for robotic missions, it is going to be much, much more. Hmm. And you have to do this. And if you don't do this, there is incredible risk. You know, I don't know whether um, you remember, in, NASA had two very public you yeah. know, yeah. spaceflight disasters. Yes. The last one where Kalpana Chala perished. Yes. So f space is very... you know, if, When the spaceship for Kalpana Chala disintegrated, it was at 100,000 feet, three so, times that of a commercial airliner. There's no chance of survival. 
So you have to be always sure that something like that doesn't happen. It's a very bold journey, as you just said. Yeah. It's not a, a journey of one person. It's a journey of 140 crores people. And that really feels, even in the US, it feels that way when, a, uh, when somebody goes. Uh, but it's a very different game, as you said. It's a very different money okay. game, very different engineering game. Let me bring in Akash Sinha, space scientist, professor at Shiv Nadar University and founder at Omnipresent Robot Tech. Uh, Mr. Sinha, there are also many spin-offs when it comes to spending on space. So, you know, you have job creation, you have uh, the automatic sort of organic creation of a talent pool of engineers who want to contribute substantially. There are also opportunities, there's space mining, there's a lot out there that we need to get into, isn't it? Well, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, Although we've had amazing success in space, but if you just look at the numbers, <clears throat> India still has only 2% of the space market, you know, mm. and given the way we are performing, I really think, as you, uh, you know, mentioned earlier, we need to uh, put a little more on spending, get in a few more startups, get more launch companies, get more research going on here, because there's a great opportunity to be part of this new space race. Huh? And, you know, I would I would want to see India from 2% go to maybe something like 10 or 20% in the next few years, if you're able to capture that. Hmm. Another thing that I want to bring and why ISRO and, you know, our communities is uh, well positioned to do that. If you see since 2015, and, and uh, of course, let me remark that it, there were no manned space missions, but but since 2015, ISRO has never had a launch failure. Huh? Like it has had like 36 consecutive successful launches, huh? which is remarkable. I mean, it's it's uh, nowhere in the world it has been uh, like that. And then this our latest engine, uh, GSLV Make 3. It has capacity of up to 10,000 kgs if we are going in low Earth orbit. Hmm. And up to 4,000 kg if we are going in geosynchronous and beyond. Huh? This does position us very well. But I think we also need to focus on even bigger rockets, you know, something that could take 25,000, 30,000 kg and, and beyond. Right. And that's where, you know, we'll get into a bigger space race. We'll get a bigger share of the pie. And I think it's a place where ISRO along with startups should come together. And, you know, government has been very good in supporting and encouraging them. And so I'm very hopeful this will happen. Okay, let me just leave you with a thought, viewers, as we wrap out of this uh, edition of Crux. Executing highly visible techno-scientific initiatives have historically served as symbols of power, modernity and status. Just spare a thought. Splitting the atom did for the United States what the printing press did for European Enlightenment. That's right, viewers. Just think about that. You need to be at the cutting edge because those nations that innovate time and again it has been proven, inherit the earth, pun intended, I leave it to that.